But uh, without further ado, uh, Armin, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. It's always a great pleasure to be in Zurich. As David pointed out, I've been spending almost 10 years in Zurich, and I can assure you these were among the best 10 years in my life. Um, so I'm very grateful for that experience. I'm going to talk about uh, culture, and I'm going to talk about culture from a complementary perspective with respect to how Guido uh, approached it. But there will be many things in common, as you will see. The focus of my talk will be on uh, economic preferences, and these economic preferences are really important for shaping our behaviors. Why? Because uh, risk, risk preference, for example, are important. Why? Because every decision that we are facing is taken typically under uncertainty. So we have to say, are we willing to take more risk or less risk? Almost any decision we are taking uh, is affecting future outcomes, which implies that our trade-offs between, our intertemporal trade-offs between what we do today and what the consequences for tomorrow are, in particular, are we willing to wait to consume, for example, if we save, to have more in the future, uh, are very relevant for our decision making. And third, uh, we are not taking decisions in isolations. We are social animals. We are interacting with people on a daily basis. And this is why social preferences are really important. And I think for an economist, there are three big questions when it comes to preferences and culture. One is a measurement issue. We need to really measure things. We have to go out there and uh, get a clear picture on the descriptives of how people differ, if they differ at all, whether they're heterogeneity. That's part one, measurement. The second is, are these differences, if we see any, are, are these differences important? Do they have implications for social outcomes, for political outcomes, for economic outcomes? And the third question is, if, the, if we see that variation, and if it is important, can we, some, can we say something about the sources, where these differences come coming from? And with these three big questions in mind, uh, I would like to um, start my presentation here. Um, I think it's fair to say that preferences are really a core notion of culture. Uh, preferences and beliefs, and this is echoing what Guido talked about before. They're central to a region's culture and systematically shape economic and social outcomes. If you look at it uh, so far, however, empirical evidence was relatively scarce and restricted to non-representative samples, and if it was representative, then typically OECD or more developed countries. And in the final talk today, Joe Henrik will talk about potentially, I'm not sure, he's, where is he? He will talk about weird samples, and very often inferences that we draw from non-representative samples can be quite misleading. So I think we need uh, representative accounts of different countries to actually say something about variation in culture in this respect. Uh, and this is the starting point of a greater research uh, agenda that we initiated some years ago, where we went out to measure preferences in representative samples on a global scale. And these samples represent about 90% of the population in the world and about 90% of GDP in the world. And in particular, we measured uh, six preferences or beliefs, trust is a belief rather than a preference, in 76 uh, representative country samples. So one measure is on the trade-off between today and later. This is time preferences, as I alluded to uh, before. The second is on risk-taking, willingness to take risk. And then we talk about social preferences, positive and negative reciprocity. With reciprocity, we mean that I'm willing to reward kind action. If someone has been uh, nice to me, I'm willing to uh, return a favor, say. This is positive reciprocity. Negative reciprocity, which is also extremely important, um, accounts for the fact that people are willing to punish someone or to sanction someone in case he or she has treated me in an unfair way or an unkind way. And then finally, trust. And Guida has talked about that trust is, of course, also very relevant. It's a very important uh, social interactive belief about whether we can or cannot um, trust other people. So with this data, um, I want to do the following. I want to address the following questions. The first is, do we see any variation across the globe? And it's very intuitive to say there must be some differences. But if you think about it, we didn't know before. So is Canada different from the US? Is Switzerland different to Austria and Germany? Um, is Italy very different to Chile, et cetera, et cetera? We didn't know that. And there's no economic models, say, or other theories that would guide us in as much as we would expect these differences uh, and what they depend on. 
Then the second question is about individual characteristics, and I will solely focus on gender here. We have done way more with age and other effects, uh, individual characteristics. And the question is, do we see gender effects in these preferences? But more importantly, are these gender effects universal? So is a gender effect that we see, for example, risk-taking that you thought is there, is that the same in every single country or culture? Or is this culturally specific? which means, do we see bigger differences, say, in men and women in, in one country than another? Okay. Um, a very important question, that's the topic of this, uh, uh, this whole session. Are these cultural, cultural differences actually relevant? Do they matter? And here I want to point out one finding, which is the relationship of patience, my willingness to, to wait today in order to have more in the future, on GDP and the wealth of nations. If I have time, I want to very briefly talk about one very important source of patience and variation in patience, which is longevity, that is, life expectancy. And that varies tremendously between countries, and economic theory would suggest that if my life expectancy is longer, I should be more patient. And we're going to test this, and I will briefly discuss some of the implications. And then finally, only one slide and no details, uh, I want to t tell you a little bit about what we know already about the origins you know, in part, very long-run, very deep origins of the variability in culture as measured in terms of preferences around the globe. And I want to point out this is joint work with uh, friends and colleagues, Anke Becker, Thomas Dumel, Benjamin Enke, who has been particularly important in this whole project, uh, Johannes Hermler, David Huffman, and Uwe Sunde. So what I'm going to show you first is just a set of slides, um, six slides, and they are very colorful, and they show you the variation in these preferences around the globe. Um, and this is what I'm doing here. So this is a world map of patients. And the way you have to read these maps is, the more blue it gets here, the more patient a country is. The more red it gets, the more impatient a country is. And one thing that you can infer from it, and we don't have time to go on all the details, of course. I'm raising more questions than I can give answers in this talk, I'm, I'm afraid is uh, there's substantial variation, right? There's substantial variation between countries. So the more colorful, the more blue and red it gets, the more variation there is. These are all standardized values, by the way. So white is, say, the average, glow, the, the, the average mean, and the more blue it is, the more patient, and the more red, the more impatient. Uh, focusing on Europe, you see a very clear east-west and north-south trend, with northern European countries being more patient than southern European countries, and Western more, more so than Eastern, but you can see there's also very interesting uh, global variation. Similarly, for risk-taking, um, there's huge variation between countries, so some countries are way more willing to take risk on average than other countries. Uh, a, a region that really sticks out here is uh, sub-Saharan countries that, that favor risk-taking behavior. Amongst the most risk-seeking countries is African countries, actually. Uh, with important implications that we show in other work, for example, for the spread of HIV, etc., um, and health outcomes. But again, there's substantial variation. Same is true for positive reciprocity. Um, again, you see big differences in Europe. If you zoom in, you also see sometimes that even neighboring countries are very different, say Mexico and, and, and the US, for example, if, if, you, if you look uh, to your left. Again, uh, Africa sticks out very low on positive reciprocity, the willingness to reward a favor, right? Uh, huge variation. Again, negative reciprocity here, Europe is actually quite pronounced. So Europeans tend to be quite negatively reciprocal. But you see, again, there's cultural divide or cultural variation with, for example, France and Germany being quite different. By the way, this data is publicly available. You can download it. Uh, and you can also produce your own rankings. And, uh, if we had time, I could show you where Switzerland, for example, is in all these rankings. Uh, but I don't have the time here. Uh, but I invite you to look at it, and you can draw your own maps and play with it and, and do statistical analysis uh, as you want to. Uh, and uh, for altruism, again, there's a scattered picture. Um, Europe is not so altruistic as we might have thought, perhaps. Um, and some countries are actually quite low compared to the global uh, average. Um, other countries are way more pro-social in that respect. And finally, trust, a measure that has been used before in the World Value Survey. And again, we see substantial variation across the globe. Now, Guida has pointed out, looking at variation in culture has two, has two margins in some sense. One is the variation between countries. This is what these figures show. That's the difference, say, between Mexico and the US, or 
um, um, uh, South Africa and, and Spain, say, uh, to, to just pick some random examples. But there's also within-country variation. And that within-country variation, in Guido's talk, was very important. And if you look at preferences around the globe, it is also very important. And in fact, the variation within country is by an order of magnitude more pronounced than the between country variation. So it's, it's very much in line with what we've seen before. Again, there's statistical measurement errors, uh, uh, issues, etc., which I don't want to focus on. But if you look at a variance decomposition, as we call it, so you look at what is bigger, the variation between countries or within countries, you will see that about 80 to 90 percent of the vari variation that we see is actually within country and only about 10, 15 percent is between countries. What that means is if you go from a say, city to a rural area or if you go by age, say old people versus young people, or if you go say uh, by education or socioeconomic status, etc., even within a country, the variation is much more pronounced than between countries. And this is true at the global level. Okay? So my next question is, um, what about individual characteristics? And again, I want to focus only on gender here. So the question is, are females more willing to take risks? Are they more patient, more altruistic than men? Or is it, or is it reverse? And what I'm showing you here is a table. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk, talk about any detail here. I just want to uh, highlight one row. So here we have the prefer preference measures. This is patience, risk-taking, positive reciprocity, negative reciprocity, altruism, and trust. And here we have a indicator variable for uh, gender, it's one if it's female, so a negative sign here implies that women are less patient than men. <laughs> As you expected, they are also less willing to take risk than men. They are more positively reciprocal, they are less negatively reciprocal, they are more altruistic, and they are more trusting than men. This is the global average. What this is, is if you believe the data collection and, and perhaps some additional assumptions, that's the representative male and the representative global female, okay? And this is what you get. But these differences, or this table, hides substantial culture-specific variation. What I mean is the following. You could think of these as being kind of universal differences. Every man is, say, on average, more risk-taking or willing to take risks than a woman. Or, culturally specific means, these differences vary by culture and by country. And if you look at this table country by country, you will see that for some of these preferences, the sign very often switches. So some countries have women that are more patient, other countries have women that are less patient, and significantly so. So this average hides tremendous variation, which was the starting point for us to ask a question, where is this variation coming from? And here's a question to you. Suppose I take an index of the gender-specific differences and preferences, and you have to listen carefully, this is the only complicated part in my talk, because we're talking about a difference. Okay, so suppose I'm interested in the difference between men and women, okay, that's the object of interest, and I'm asking you the question, do you expect or would you predict that these differences get bigger or smaller when countries get richer? So have, you go from less developed to more developed countries, will you see bigger gender differences or smaller gender differences? What do you think? I'm not supposed to ask the question, but now I did anyways. Any intuition? Smaller. Very nice, bigger. Okay, that's, that's enough. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. This, uh, is, this is the perfect response. Um, uh, and it's reflecting exactly what you know, we don't know in the, first, in the first place. And there's very different intuitions about, about this. Let me ask you a second question. Don't think about economic development, so how rich a country is. Think about instead gender equality. We've created an index using various indices from the UN, from the World Bank, various indices, and constructed uh, an index for each country how gender equal it is. Women's suffrage, for example. By the way, today, 100 years ago, Germany uh, started women's uh, suffrage, which is celebrated today for good reason, I think. That is part of it, uh, the female-male labor market ratio, and some other indicators. So my question is, 
are gender differences and preferences larger or smaller if you go from less gender equal countries to more gender equal countries? So think about Sweden here at the very right uh, in terms of you know, gender equality and other countries that are less gender equal. Do you see bigger differences in preference or smaller differences? Smaller. Smaller, bigger, thank you. <laughs> uh, works perfectly. The answer is, for both questions, differences increase. And they increase substantially. So on the left panel here, I'm showing you for all pre and this is true for each single preference, this is a composite uh, measure for all preferences, the richer a country gets, the more pronounced are the gender differences. And the right panel shows a gender equality index, the more gender equal a country gets, the more different uh, the genders are in terms of uh, their expressed preferences. Maybe we come back to, back to this um, later on. Do you have, do you have a little more time? Yeah. A couple more minutes. Okay, so I have to really speed up. One question I wanted to show you is, is are these cultural differences really relevant? Mm -hmm. And um, here I want to focus just on one figure then, uh, on the role of patients and GDP. Economic theory would suggest that more patient countries should invest more, and because they invest more, they should also become more richer. So here's a cultural trait, patients, that could have an immediate effect on economic development. And this is uh, uh, exactly what we find. This, the left panel shows a relationship between patients and locked GDP, and the raw correlation is 0.63, which is very, very big. The right panel controls for various things, among others, conditional uh, uh, ge geographic, climatic uh, uh, controls, continent fixed effect, genetic diversity, et ethnic diversity, but you can see the correlation remains. So more patient countries are, are richer, and this is backed up by investment processes. So more patient countries have more, uh, um, uh, have a higher capital stock, which is exactly in line with the economic prediction. Uh, they do more into human capital. This is years of schooling patients, more patient countries invest more in schooling and education, and that's an innovation index, a composite index of various uh, uh, sub-factors of innovation. Again, almost a straight line, more patient countries are more innovative. Patience itself has a strong background in longevity, and this is then really my last minute. Um, and this is very important because if you think about it, suppose you're born into an environment with low life expectancy. You're not expecting to live long. And that induces you to become impatient, which makes perfect sense. Suppose you die tomorrow, there's no point in saving and waiting, right? But taken to the limit. Um, but this then could create a vicious circle in the sense that if you're born into a bad environment, low longevity, low investment, then you're reproducing the bad environment you were born into because it slows down investment and, and growth and health expenditures, and that feeds back into low life expectancy. And we find, in fact, a very strong correlation between life expectancy at birth and patients, so in countries that face bad conditions in terms of health and life expectancy, are generally uh, more impatient. Uh, I don't have time, unfortunately, to talk about some deep uh, cultural and historical roots. If we have time in the discussion, we may or may not want to come back. This is David's choice. What I can tell you is, we have investigated this, and there seems to be some very systematic, very long-run um, variation that accounts, uh, uh, at least in part, uh, for the variation that we see in terms of culture as of today when it comes to preferences. Thank you very much. <laughs>